JP, welcome back to 10% True. Thanks for joining us on the channel again. Yeah, good to see you again. So for anybody who's tuning in on this, this is clearly part two. There is a, a part one with JP where he talked about how he got into the Royal Air Force and ended up flying tornadoes. This was just ahead of the uh, first Gulf War in 1991. And um, if you if you haven't watched that, go back and watch that now because it will make this second part make sense. But JP, when we left off last time, you had talked about how you were going to go and hit this airfield target in Iraq. There had been some debate about the tactic that was going to be used. You'd argued at your case but had ultimately lost and you had therefore resigned yourself for the fact you were going to go out and fly the mission and we got to the point where I'd said to you did you have any trepidation and you said that there was you were just walking to get something to eat and you just so there was this sharp intake of breath when you paused and then you got on with it and and that's really the point that we got to so can you pick up where you left off uh yes uh, certainly so yes you suddenly realize it's it's real um and that sounds a bit weird you you know it's real anyway but it's just sort of okay we are going uh breakfast came back finished uh the planning and then pretty much you're in a uh a funnel that you've done ten thousand times you know uh, you get you you finish the plan you go you then walk off to you've got all your maps you've had the briefing so you have an intense brief before you go flying of uh, what could, should, what ifs, and all that sort of stuff, standard procedures. Uh, you go off to the changing room and you get into your kit. Well, you're in flying kit, but you put all your flying kit on. Uh, but you also uh, sort of, when I say uh, you sterilize yourself, what that means, you take off anything that uh, things like rings, uh, anything that distinguishes you uh, at all. So all your flying badges come off there on Velcro, so you take those off so that you literally are name, rank, number, date of birth, effectively. Just uh, they, they, they won't even say whether you're a pilot or navigator because all those badges are off. So uh, you change, you put your G-suit on, your, um, your life jacket, you've got your gun holster which is a a, a gun in a, a shoulder holster uh, and you basically make sure you've got everything right you go out to the um authorization desk uh you're authed for the mission and then uh, you walk out to the airplane and at that time you're very much thinking uh trying to get every on everything sequenced in your head which is a pretty standard uh, process really for um any sort of flying mission but in this particular case, I, I think the thing that stood out for me as you were walking out to the jet is when you've got live weapons on, there are a whole load of flags, which basically we have uh, uh, bolts that stop the, uh, the, the, the explosive ejection units to push the bombs off. So everything that hangs off the jet, everything uh, that hangs pylon pins, basically, everything hangs off the pylon and you have pins on. Uh, and each of those pins have flags to to make sure you pull them out. And you're very much, I remember thinking, I don't know, I need, I don't know, 33. I need to make sure I've got 33 pins. You work out how many pins per pylon that you need to take. Uh, and then pretty much you go through your sequence. You know, you've got the, the sort of green and red lights of the cockpit. Uh, you walk around, do your checks. And pretty much uh, start up, and we were very nervous about making sure that the aircraft worked. You didn't want to be left behind. Now, one of the other guys in our formation, unfortunately, their jet didn't wasn't serviceable, so they went off to another jet to get airborne, and I don't think that one got well. That didn't get serviceable either. So that I can imagine how they felt because that would. Uh, be really irritating on your first uh, operational mission. Um, so we went off as a three ship. So um, so that was our, yeah, you take off, you climb to height uh, to join the tanker, uh, you refuel on the way, and then, um, and then you get to that point where you have to drop off the tanker to actually drop down to low level because we're doing a high, low, high sort. So to get the range, you go high level, 
then drop down below the race radar horizon where because when you're at height obviously everyone can see you want to drop down so you get below the radar which is the whole point of low level uh so they avoid uh engagement by missiles as well so you drop off and you start pushing down to uh going down as a formation to low level uh at that stage you've T taken off all your switches, so you've switched your guns and bombs and everything. Everything is life, basically. So that, um, so now that you're going into enemy territory, that you can fire the gun, you could drop a bomb if you wanted. Um, you've taken off absolutely everything that will distinguish you uh, and highlight you. And you're going on into targets. So we, you go from basically, uh, you know, the tanker, which is about 15, 16,000 feet down to low level. So you go from a bird's eye view of the world down to um, 50 feet above the ground. So you go from uh, or a anodyne sort of serenity of height into suddenly you feel the sand and the, the rock as you're, you're bumming along the ground, flying your bum along the ground at uh, 50 feet. Were you in a, a trail formation then? What, what formation were you in? No, we're we're in battle formation. Uh, the, the way it works, just to battle formation is uh, back in the day you fly beam each other uh, because we have a blind spot in our six o'clock. So you fly beam each other by a couple of miles, which means we can see five six miles behind each other. So should any fighter come and drop in, blindside you, uh, we can come across and engage them with missiles. So uh, that's how we went on on the mission. So, uh, so you count down there is, uh, you know, we've done that lots of times before, low level, because we've been out there, uh, flown over the sand, etc. But then you get to the split point, you come off this, uh, where the formation we were going to attack from two sides. So we uh, went off our way, the other two went off the other way. And um, yes, just then from pretty much as you started getting close to the airfield, you start getting uh, shot at. So suddenly you're getting um, anti-aircraft guns. So they're like ribbons in the sky. These kind of you see the tracer coming towards you. Uh, you get plumes of missiles. You get anti-aircraft uh, flak. So great big puffs of black smoke on the left and right as you're going in. And then your whole tempo is moving up with John doing the radar, me cross-checking. I'm flying lower as well. So we've picked up speed to about 600 knots. Um, so And you're pushing down in height. So probably 15 feet, 20 feet, whatever it is. I can't tell. You're basically really low. You're, you're flying your bum along the ground. So if you've seen the Top Gun movie number two, uh, that whole profile and you see them flying over the desert, with that was our height and speed that we were going in. And we were going to do a loft attack. And a loft attack is where to attack an airfield, obviously you've got this almost like dome of defences where you get medium, short range guns for missiles. So you don't really want to fly within this defensive dome that they have around the airfield, it's a ringed airfield. So what you do is a loft, if this is the dome, we fly up and then we pull up a number of miles away from target and we throw the bombs into the airfield. So, uh, so it means you're in that space for a very short period of time. So you almost enter it and a loft, you pull up, the bombs go off and the speed and the G of the aircraft throw the bombs a number of miles. And then we recover and it's basically called a loft maneuver where you turn upside down, pull, rotate. So it's azimuth height and turn. So it's very difficult for a missile system to lock up because everything's changing, height, direction, and, and you're only there temporarily and we run out the other way very quickly. Um, so as we got close to the target, yeah, everything's happening then. I mean, I'm literally flying through crisscrosses of bullets. You've got puffs of black smoke everywhere, plumes of missile, everyone's shooting at you, wham, wham, wham. Uh, and a clock is running down in the head-up display. You've got this green circle which winds down to zero. And at that point, the weapons computer takes over. Uh, you, yeah, so it gets down to zero. I pull up and I commit, which means it's not like an old aircraft where you push the red button, the bombs come off, which is called pickle. Uh, you commit where you put, hold the button and the computer works out when to throw the bomb in, in the right manner. So I'm going, I'm going up, by which time everyone's shooting us because we're more visible. Um, but my whole he head up display, all the green lines and everything just dump on me. And I'm going, shit, 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 where's it going? Um, and 
everything's just gone and it dumps on me and I'm going up and up and you're going up really fast. I mean, this is seconds, less than seconds, you know, you're, you're, you know, you're at a thousand feet before you know it. And by the time of that height, you, you know, go shit. So I shit, I roll upside down and I commence my recovery and the bombs hadn't come off. Uh, so, you know, I've now got a tricky thing, which I didn't really think about at the time. I just completed a, a loft manoeuvre, but a loft manoeuvre, I mean, it killed a couple of guys in the Gulf, so it's quite a dangerous manoeuvre. Well, I've never done a loft recovery with eight tonnes of bombs on, you know, uh, so, and it's really aggressive, certainly in the way we did in the war, we're doing 4G to really get it down fast, to get down below uh, to escape the defences. So, yeah, I recovered the uh, the loft manoeuvre with 8,000 pound bombs on uh, to get back down to, you know, 20, 30 feet or what have you to escape. And uh, and I am the whole time, if you heard the black tear, I'm just swearing at John. Uh, I thought he'd made a mistake. Uh, that is our chagrin that we're labelled that did did he make the wrong switch error uh, in our book? We said. He, we said we might as well just say he did because it's the easiest thing. There are a number of other things that could have uh, occurred with it. Uh, I don't believe John did push the wrong button. Um, he never had pushed the wrong button. So, uh, and there are a number of technical things which are not worth going through series. There's a number of technical things as to why they didn't come off. Uh, and I have a letter at home uh, which someone wrote to me saying had this could be the case uh, and i believe that one and it's all about maths of ballistics and how computers work out and the hype we were going in at so there's a whole load of stuff there but you know uh we we're then bugging out we're going okay do we re-attack because you know you're gutted you know you you live this elitist life and you got to go back to all your mates who've done their job and say so we cocked up how do you do that uh but so do we re-attack but it's June clear day, they know you're coming, they've seen you coming, you're going to die, they're going to just make a better job, everybody's going to be shooting, because we, the other guys come from the other direction, the whole point is you're, you, they don't know which direction you come, whereas if we, as a sole aircraft, went in, the whole air, airfield will be looking at us. So, um, and there's another mission, you know, you've only got a five minute window, and there's another mission coming in three, three, four minutes later to do their job, so it's quite a tight uh, bracket that you do your your mission on and that's how you overwhelm shock and awe with mission 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 on the airfield to overwhelm their defenses so we then made a decision i pushed the red button and the bombs go dud in the desert and that for me is the failure of our war uh but then you've got to get home so we're going home uh and on the on the way home uh we uh went over what was looked like a small uh unit of men but there were quite a few of them uh, and one guy, and this is the point, you know, you've got a 25 million pound aircraft there, uh, with a handheld miss 50 grand, probably for, uh, a, a handheld, probably Sam 16, they reckon, which is a handheld tube, looks like a bazooka, uh, shot the missile. Uh, we didn't see it. It was right in our six o'clock. Uh, and it was a lucky shot, you know, shoot down jet with a pea shooter, really. Uh, and uh, the missile went right up our right hand engine. The first thing I knew, you know, we're at 50 feet doing about 550 knots or what have you. And uh, the whole aircraft just goes kabang. It's like being hit by an express train. The whole aircraft rotates and it's almost like a sycamore seed. I'm seeing sand and sky and sand and sky and I'm trying to control the aircraft. I go to John, prepare to jet, prepare to jet. I can't hold it. He said, don't you bloody well eject the whole, you know, the whole pace of life has suddenly accelerated to a really... I grabbed the wings to uh, put them forward to get me more to control. The aircraft comes under control. You get wow, wow, wow. I look down, my right-hand engine's on fire. We've got a, a panel here with about 50 lights which tell us what's uh, wrong with the aircraft. Well, it's like a bloody Christmas tree. Uh, the flyable wire's gone out, being blown out as well. So I've gone from a Grand Prix race car as if I've, you know, you've got all the finesse of the computers. Well, that's all gone. And basically, flyable wire is I've only got one control system, which is the tailor on, and that's connected by metal rods. And it really is. You move the stick, and about a second later, the aircraft actually moves. I mean, it's really kind of... 
Uh, so I'm actually quite re pleased I recovered the aircraft given I was in mech mode. Um, then on the right hand side, an anti aircraft battery opens up the bullets that hit my right hand wing and they hit my side winder missile, which is about four feet on my right hand wing away from me. It ignites the rocket panel and a four meter torch of flame shoots out the front of the wing and slowly but surely starts to cut my right hand wing off. Um, and so we've got some major problems here. We try and put the fire out uh, because we can do 400 knots on the other engine. Uh, couldn't put the fire out. Uh, I've got the fiber wire. I've got the, the missile on fire. I look back. John starts screaming, we're on fire, we're on fire. This is about two, three minutes later. And I said, I know I'm on fire because I'm flying this aircraft like this pretty much straight. And he said, no, look back. I look back and it, there's just a wall of orange flame it was like flying the nose of an aircraft outside this comet of flame it you know and we were doing 400 knots or so and this this wall of flame was coming towards us i couldn't see the fin the fins 13 feet high i couldn't see it there was this huge disc of orange flame i looked out on my right hand wing i couldn't see my right hand wing it was just orange uh with fuel pouring out the back even the fuel pouring out the back was on fire so i had this great big bulb of orange flame right next to me bright orange this disc coming towards my basically we are surrounded by orange and you're going shit this is <laughs> craft is not going to survive uh and so we we made a number of checks uh ready to eject uh i eased the aircraft up uh and it was three two one eject 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 so if you imagine me easing up and how fast we're going uh, we ejected at 320 feet so uh we were not very high uh, because this aircraft was going no further. So uh, you you eject, it's like almost like having a giant grab your shoulders and yank you out the cockpit. You get all the no rocket noises, my eyes are closed. Uh, you feel the jolt, bang, you're on the end of your parachute. I look down, you're not very high. You unclip the box in the back, you sit on a box. Um, you need to release that because you can land if the box is when you hit the ground and the box is uh, still attached uh, around your waist. It hangs around the back of your legs. You can land, it will just basically break your legs. So uh, I release the box down, it hangs down on a piece of rope. You prepare yourself to land, uh, parachute. Uh, all I remember, it just bloody hurt. It's like, you know, jumping off a 12 foot wall, but you're meant to roll and do all the parachute shit. No, I didn't. I just kind of landed like a sack of potatoes. Uh, and that's it, you're on the ground. I wanted to obviously you're, we've got a, a, a finite amount of time to to go through what happens next. So I don't want to spend too much time um, discussing sort of the escape and evasion bit, such as it was. Um, I'd like to really understand the interrogation side of things and the captivity side of things. That's where I'd like to try and, and drive mm. this conversation. Um, but just just quickly on that, then, did you get injured during the ejection process? Did you or John get injured during the ejection process? Uh uh, John didn't. Uh, I am I knew I hurt my knee a bit when I say a bit, it was only a little bit. But the personal uh, equipment connector, which is where our oxygen tubes and radios uh, on that connects us to the seat, had obviously flown up and hit some, uh, the visor. So I and I'd got a cut above my eye, and uh, not a big cut, but a, a cut above my eye. So, um, so that was really it. Um, other than that, you know, uh, what I subsequently found out later is, and this was after the war, that uh, I had wedging, so two crushed vertebra vertebrae, my fifth and sixth thoracic vertebrae had been smashed together and it broke. Basically, I got broken back. They had broken 15% uh, on each of the... Um, the my vertebrae had been fractured oh. so capture came fairly quickly yes we were in the desert for about two to three hours um you know we made our plan i mean it was a bit ridiculous in the desert you know when we landed because you've got all sorts of you know parachutes in bright orange we couldn't get our walkie-talkie out without bright orange opening up our life jacket so the ground's completely flat visibility 50k you know, you got a burning tornado. I mean, you might as well have had whistles and bangs and flags saying this is where we are. Uh, but we started our evasion. We made a plan. Uh, 
And about two hours later, uh, a van arrived, a, a sort of pickup truck, and about 20 soldiers got out, spread out, coming towards us with the Klasnikov machine guns. Then you got a decision, John said, you know, shall we go out with the bangers and shall we stand up, take a couple of shots of them? Because we knew what was going to happen if we got captured from uh, all the expectations of Saddam's regime. That was the time I said, no, there's always hope. Uh, and pretty much we were buried in the sand by machine gun fire. I'd taken out my contact lens because I wore contact lenses and it was just there. We were lying on the sand. There was nowhere to hide. And the very first bullet blew the contact lens away from here. It was only about two inches from my head, and then there were probably hundred thousands of bullets all bouncing around our head. I mean, literally, it was that many bullets we were buried in, being buried in the sand by the, the amount of bullets hitting the sand. Uh, eventually, they stopped. Uh, it was a bit of a dick dance to try and say who, you know, we were trying to give up, but they were scared of us, which is funny because we've only got two um, PPKs. Got to us, beat us up a bit, blindfolded us took us off to the local airfield at the local airfield that we'd just been attacking the air crew there they interrogated us but when i say that they were quite you know they were quite respectful actually and they said look you've got to talk to us we said nothing talk to us or else we'll have to send you to the nasty people in baghdad um and uh, that's what they did so 10 hours to get to baghdad uh, we approached as we were approaching Baghdad and it was dark and you could see Baghdad actually being bombed like you see on the TVs, all the like, you know, the anti-aircraft guns. That's when things started getting nasty, started smashing a face against the side of the lorry, hitting around the head with pistol butts. You enter in the city, everyone's manically firing Glasnikov in the sky. You've got the anti, uh, you've got the bombs going off got the anti-aircraft guns, those are very frightening because they're extremely loud, they're on tops of buildings, um, really loud, and they kind of consume you. The van stops, uh, you know, we're blindfolded and handcuffed, uh, they push you out, it feels like you go through this corridor of troops who are kicking, rifle butting and thumping you, they push you into an ops building, within two seconds of getting into the ops, suddenly you hear this huge, <laughs> and uh, a bomb hits the building we're in. So the whole, all the walls are blown up, the ceiling comes down, we're picked up and it was like the hand of God and thrown uh, about two to three metres and end up on, under a pile of desk, rubble and chairs. Mm. They, uh, when the dust settles, they pull us out, they put me in a, a room on my own, I'm trying handcuffed and blindfolded, still trying to pull my uh, head thing off. Uh, and then the door opens, I don't know. A number of men come in. Uh, my world goes black. What had you been told then? You said to John, there's always hope. What had you been told by your intel people um, that would happen to you if you were captured? It's not so uh, specific as that. It, it, it's more, you know, air interrogation will involve violence you know uh, and you know Saddam's reputation and you, you know it is it's you you, uh, you anticipate or you don't need to be a rocket scientist to guess you know your uh, your air crew you're bombing their country they are known to be a violent um, state uh, they, I don't think they'd signed the Geneva Convention, so you're not expecting um, a nice conversation. Um, what is going through your mind then when this is happening, as, you, as you're being, with increasing intensity, beaten as you go through this journey from the desert to this ops building? Do, do you, I mean, are you taught, one of the things I'm really curious to understand is the psychology. Are you taught at survival school when, when you know, Siri is the American version. I don't know what the Brits call it, but you taught techniques, um, methods of of dealing emotionally and psychologically with the things that are about to happen to you. Is there anything that you can do um, to protect mentally yourself from what is going on, or are you resigned to the fact that this is going to be a pretty ugly ordeal? Uh, yeah. <laughs> It's going to be a pretty ugly ordeal, but the military does what the military does. A certain type of character joins the military, I'm assuming. Uh, 
And then over the millennia of us fighting wars, we know, you know, the classic, you know, during officer training or all, all that sort of thing. Let's send you up another hill with the concrete blocks for no apparent reason to make you walk 25 miles or what have you. And it's all about that you can go beyond your physical limits. Then you've got the tenacity and endurance of going through flying training, which is mentally uh, tough. But within all that, uh, really, all, most military training is crisis uh, immersive training in crisis management how do you when the world goes to batshit do you objectively make good decisions under pressure that is effectively military uh training so that is there's part of that in fact that we've done survival training as well so you do survival training i had done some interrogation training which is basically just telling you almost effectively about the psychological tools that they use to break your will so it's things like hard cop soft cop you know start asking that type thing uh repetition questions all those uh sleep deprivation you know uh sensory deprivation it's called dislocation of expectations so you, if someone's been shot down you you got you you got the anxiety of that and they want to sustain and it's only short lived that anxiety of the shot down bit and they want to keep that level of anxiety, that level of uncertainty where you're completely unsure, you don't know what's happening. And so that gives you a psychological pressure. So all that added together, you know, no water, no sleep, uh, violence, separation, all this sort of thing creates a level of uncertainty in the human psyche. However, balance that off with the type of character, our military training. And, and throughout that whole time, effectively, now, is it me? Is it military training? Probably mostly military training. Uh, in that sequence, shot down, you're literally on the ground. OK, once we laughed on the ground, you know, go because we giggle. That's, you know, what the hell are we going to do? You then say, right. And you almost go flying package out. Right. We're now in evasion. And you kind of almost slot that in. Right. Let's do this. What's what's our priorities? What do we need to do? Bang, bang, bang. Then, you know, the troops arrive. You almost slot that one. OK, they're going to do it. So you actually you go through a sequence where you're, you're, you're pretty objective and realistic. And I think that's military training, you know, yeah, it's high stress. Okay. How do we deal with this? What's the main decision we have to make, make the decision, live with the result. Oh shit, that didn't work. What's, what's our situation now? What do we need to do? So you actually are pretty, um, sequential, you know, that's why I find, I find it interesting that people panic so much when I see, even in my business, your consultancy people go, ah, and you go, stop. Okay, it's fretful. St what is actually happening here? What's the decision you need to make? Oh, it's now all gone. Something else. Did we try that and did it? Fine. Stop. What's happening? So you get very used to almost dealing with the adrenaline rush and everything. Uh, so, and, and that's where you sequence in, you suddenly go, right, we're shot down. I'm now invasion. Uh, guns are now this right in the car right i'm now going to enter a different thing what do i anticipate what do i do how am i going to deal with it right i'm now i uh, being blown up okay okay i'm fine i'm not hurt right bang oh, the beating up okay i was <laughs> um unconscious and then then you're taken to they took me out after the beating and <clears throat> you're suddenly standing in a room and uh the room's pretty standard size room 10 by 12 feet something like that you can feel the hot lights on you. <clears throat> You're standing there blindfolded, handcuffed, bag in your head, and you can smell and sense there's about seven, eight men in there. You can smell sweat. You can smell smoke. They're all smoking. Uh, you have a sense of, you can smell violence and you can smell death in there, basically. And you go, shit, well, this is now, well, this is now probably what's going to happen. You don't think this is where I'm going to die. You now think, right, okay. I need to be here now. How do I use my brain? Start the interrogation sort of mindset. So at each stage, it's really quite um, not exactly planned, but it is. It, it's, it's feeding in your next cassette. When I read um, the accounts of Vietnam War veterans who, who are who are pals in Hanoi uh, Hill, Hills, 
they talk a little bit about the inevitability of giving up information and the fact that you have to make the interrogator work for it. So you know they're going to break you. This is what you know what I'm what I'm reading. You know they're going to break you, but and they're going to get bits of information out of you, and some information is going to age. So if you you know if you're asked a question on day one of your capture uh, and you give the information, it might be useful to the enemy. But if you give that information on day thirty, it could have been what the tasking order was mm-hmm. or what was going to happen in the next twenty four hours. You know that kind of that kind of thing. So there's, there, it's, it feels like there's almost a kind of schema. Uh, behind the concept of being broken and giving information. And I wondered whether or not you had that too, whether or not in your mind you had decided that, you know, it was inevitable that you would give some information or you would give some answers. You you know, the, the Geneva Convention is, you know, name, is it name ranks? Or name well, rank back number? in the day, it was the big four, name rank number data birth. Yeah, so you would go beyond that. It was inevitable. Did you see it the same way? Did you, Had you created a framework in your mind or? No, I, hadn't, I, I pretty much bought into the fact that I don't give out any information. Uh, however naive, and it's pretty naive, really thinking back uh, but no I just kind of thought I will not give out information I know this sounds silly and it makes me sound a complete knob this but it's just not cricket but I, and that makes how stupid does that make me childish and pathetic does that make me sound but you just don't give out information and that I balance that that off <clears throat> with you know you want to be you want to conform to all almost the war movies you want to be an officer you want to you don't want to let other you're totally isolated but you have a sense of responsibility to all your the air force your friends on squad and everything so i've got that and the fact that you're a naturally competitive person as well you know everything up to my that time in my life pretty much worked so why would i why would i expect not to work now uh balanced off that is actually having now done that process this whole thing of name rank number date of birth and don't release information really it is to you could say delay the inevitable it gives you something to ha- hang your hat on so rather than just kind of talk uncontrollably let's say because your anxiety by giving that framework it it settles the mind so as the first you know baseball bat hits you kind of go shit and your brains are scrambled and and at least name rank number it gives you a framework to hand up until actually you get used to the beatings, which you do. Uh, so it, it does give a useful framework. But on reflection, since the war, you go in the modern world. What do you give them? We have a pointy end and a hot end. We go forward. We can't go back. Um, we drop bombs and obviously we're blowing up targets. But they're asking all sorts of questions where you go. Irrelevant. What frequency do you fly with? Frequency agile. You feed in codes and then we only have five hours of frequencies at frequency agile jump. What does this do? I haven't got a clue. Switch it on. It does its bit. What about this? Don't know. What about, you know, X, Y, Z? We have codes. We're only issued codes. They're irrelevant now because it was five hours ago. Um, Basic. You really give them nothing, you know, because you can't. So, yeah, uh, I do buy into uh, the, you know, uh, the need to know principle and the need to know if you don't know anything, you can't tell them anything. And that saves violence. So that's what I used to come back when I said to a fellow air crew, when you get back, this need to know. Yeah, live by it, because what you don't need, no, you you don't. They, they can tell when you're you know saying I don't know. And they know in, you know, they've got all the psychologists looking at you probably at the same time. And they know that you don't know. So um, it is, um, yeah. So you don't really know very much, to be honest. Can Can you go back and and describe a bit more about what something something you said just a couple of minutes ago? You said you get used to the beatings, and that was about thirty seconds after saying when they first hit you with a baseball bat. And I've never been hit with a baseball bat. Uh, I, I can't even imagine what that's like. But how does that work then? How does getting used to beatings work? Do you mean? Um, the psychology of it in in terms of it's coming and therefore you accept it or do you mean it somehow doesn't hurt as much uh both uh what happens is the first one base brown head so you know name rank number are you pilot or navigator i said i was going to say i cannot answer that question sir which is what you say uh back in the day uh for any other question other than name rank number date of birth 
I went to I cannot, and uh, suddenly you, you literally your head explodes. I mean, it literally you are taken off your feet and you're on the ground. And then for the first 40, 40 minutes or so, you've got five, six men with baseball bats just smacking your body, and you're on the ground like a rag doll. Your whole head is lolling around. You uh, you can't even form uh, the F word in your head. You're just totally uh, as your your whole body is just you. You're trying to curl up, but they're just smacking you with base of bats. They pull you back up again by your hair every time. The name, Hank, are your partner and Abigail? I cannot. And you go back down on the floor. Uh, and they, during the time, and the first uh, three, four days were most intense. So you don't, no sleep for four to five days. Uh, no food. Uh, no water for the first three days and that's really bad uh, so you're really in a bad shape uh, and throughout that time consistently uh, you are beaten with baseball bats rubber truncheons they set your hair on fire they burn you with cigarettes they threaten you with gang rape they threaten you with uh, shoving guns and knives up your ass you have mock executions of guns against head you know fingers pulled uh, you know you hear other people being tortured uh, you know, they burn you with cigarettes. Uh, just all the stuff you see in the movies, really. Uh, so it becomes you becomes a very intense uh, sort of fight. Where it's trying to battle of will. Uh, the when I said it, you get used to it, you learn how the interrogation works, you learn the inflection in their voice, you listen to the voices, what they're trying to achieve. Uh, your bom body does become numb to the beatings after a while. Uh, you know, they all hurt, but you almost go, well, that was a shit beating compared to the last one. Uh, you know, that wasn't as, quite as effective. Um, and, and so you... you the beating is almost like domestic violence when people understand how does a, a female stay in a, an abusive relationship it the violence normalizes it that just becomes your life and you live moment to moment between each of the violence and trying to assess how you're doing how they're doing um so it becomes a battle of will so it is a mental fight actually it's not a physical fight was there any one thing that they could do to you that you were particularly um frightened by you make your own list they're going to break your arms cut your balls off pull your teeth out um you know uh, set dogs on you uh kneecap you uh rape you put a knife up your ass or a gun up your ass you know uh uh what do you want do you want to you know i are, are they going to put your head uh in shit filled water you know make your list you know, which one of those is preferable? How would you grade them? How would you prioritize them? You know, this is what I find funny when you get back. You go, uh, people go, you know, how often were you hit? I don't fucking know. You know, how often was John hit? I don't know. He was in another room. And people want a pigeonhole where, where we break. Who was braver, John or me? Who was, you know, how did you deal with this? What, you know, what is worse? You go, I don't know. I don't know your own face. I've told this story for decades and i've met people two three years after i've told my story and i'm really disciplined the, the fish does not become this big i very much that's what happened to me and it's historic um uh, you know um an account and i keep it as it is but people go oh when they waterboard you i wasn't waterboarded people impose their own fear mm. so what would scare you you know what would scare you well out of all that list the the reason I asked that question was because I wonder whether or not you're 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 playing the long game in inverted commas, which is that you you want to um, get out of there at the end and go back and see your your family or your wife or your, whatever it is. You want to go home at some point, and and whether or not in your mind you're grading the things they can do to you in terms of the long term damage that it does to you. So if they beat you up, they beat you up. If they start um, shoving things up your ass, you're going to get infections right so then you know yeah. so, so you're going to end up with something that could potentially kill you and mean that you don't get out of there so that's kind of why i was wondering i was wondering if there was in your mind a, a, a of all these horrific things there was sort of a scale where actually you'd rather get more beatings than have this because actually the long-term effects might be 
better uh, you don't other. think that i i basically on the 10 hour drive on the way and i made a mantra to myself because uh, i knew that i was going to do it and i thought right i might right and this is about this idea of almost this cassette things you know you i'm in the car being driven to baghdad and i thought right so you go i'm no longer a fag but i'm no longer evading i'm now on the way to this next event i know what's going to happen to me they're going to be violent and uh the mantra i said for 10 hours and set my mind because i'd seen the prisoner of war movies you know and midnight express you know all those sort of those sorts of old movies and how the prisoner of war came back damaged you know you get all the vietnam movies where you know somehow they're damaged they're post-traumatic stress or this and that and i i made a promise myself i will not come out a damaged human being i am either going to die here or i'm going to disappear in the middle east for 10 years whatever the wars happen i'm going to disappear into the middle east for 10 years and my phrase was you can break my arms cut my balls off pull my teeth out if i'm still around in 10 years time i will not be a damaged human being and when i release in 10 years time if i'm not dead helen will have remarried my children will call someone else daddy i will not damage their lives either life has taken a different course i will want to see them but i'll let them carry on on the course a because our lives have now split so that was my concept i suppose of love um and so i set my mind rape so i you know if i had been raped i'd be telling you now so i had a penis up my ass right uh i'm not i'm not uh gay uh i don't have a problem if you are gay it's not my choice i've never had a penis up my ass if if i had i'd be saying look i had look why it had was not choice rape is rape whether you're male or female it's a it's a crime of power not sex so you go what choice if they need i'm a little bloke if you need four guys to hold me down to rape which they did i had six guys holding me down when i thought i was going to get gang raped um what choice do i have in that matter and if that bothers you as a man and questions your masculinity you will lose because it's not the physical violence it's the mental they're trying to get in your head so don't be foolish whatever they do you accept what they do you just deal with the result so that's i set my mind for death or pain basically um and actually i'm quite did i find something in captivity i'm quite surprised i'm quite a i know i'm military but i'm not that military i kind of find myself but i actually quite i i don't know what i found but i found a comfort with myself i found a a sense of commitment to that that um, I'm quite proud of. When we talked before the first interview, <clears throat> just before we were hitting, uh, before we hit record, we somehow got into a conversation about um, death or life or whatever it was, and you'd said you're not you're not frightened of death. And I, I wanted to ask you then: is that lack of fear of death connected to your experience in in Iraq? Then did you have the same feeling about death before? captivity i've never thought about death before who thinks about death for god's sake uh you know uh i suppose uh, i'll do this very quickly because it's very uh it's all rather uh deep but i found myself in captivity doing one of the things doing this praying to god because i was really fright frightened i thought what am i doing because i'd say i was agnostic but I was brought up when I went to Boy Scout, you know, school, when I was brought up, uh, schools did, uh, you know, you got all the the Christian bit, the Bible bit, you got all the uh, Sunday school bit, you got the Cubs and Scouts, all that sort of stuff, all quite Christian related. I was from about 12, I was really into it, uh, then it left me by about 14, 15. So I'd call myself agnostic and I went, what am I doing? Am I doing this because of Pavlov's dog? As in, I had all this almost conditioning that 
we get told God exists? Or do we create a psychological construct as in human beings get really scared over the millennia of humankind, we need to create a bigger being. It's actually a psychological construct to cope with the uncertainties of life. Or am I praying to a deity? And at the time I believed in a deity. Uh, it left me the moment I left uh, captivity. And I suppose I'm agnostic again, probably more nearer, closer to atheist. Uh, but I found myself going, I don't think, from my experience now, uh, every single religion, this thing we called life is meant to be, okay, I'm mixing my metaphors here, but almost purgatory. You know, oh my God, life is really bad. And we're put on earth as for three score years and 10 by a, a, a benevolent God who tests us. And if we don't believe in him because we can't see him, uh, we go to hell. But if we do, uh, this horrible time we have on earth, three score years and 10, we go to Nirvana, we go to heaven everlasting happiness everlasting love every all pain removed and beauty for infinity so we're only given 70 years for all our uh, fears uh, and but for infinity only if we believe in something we can't see and that's every single religion christianity if you're really good uh islam if you're really good you go to a perfect world uh buddhism you you get reincarnated to uh, the highest of the chain um and and even if you're atheist there's nothing so every single belief system in the world when death arrives there is no pain there is beauty and better so if you are a true believer you should want to die because there there is imperfection and everything our hearts desires hmm. i don't have a problem with nothingness so at the end of my con you know i think therefore i am and you can tell i spent weeks in captivity no one talks like this for god's sake but i uh, you know but you go i th i think we're frightened of three things pain humiliation and loss none of us want pain and that's what frightens of us death humiliation you know it's like everyone at the moment we used to be scared of cancer but now gosh we can't scare people with cancer anymore because there's a great recovery oh let's scare everyone with dementia okay well you don't want to be the person in your nappies going la 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 do you so you go so that's humiliation you don't want to humiliate yourself your dignity and loss is is very much if i die i won't see my children grow up or i won't see my grandchildren or i lose the people i love so that's all about dealing with nothingness and the fact that our worlds revolve around ourselves so none of us want pain humiliation or loss so uh that sounds very deep you can tell uh that no one spends their life thinking like that but those are the things uh i did and if and death you could ultimately remove pain humiliation and loss because death itself removes all that and if you are either into nothingness or into everlasting um uh happiness effectively so it's the process of dying so I'm, i was scared about the process of dying but death itself why be scared of death well, there are that yeah they yeah, very deep meaningful Blah. I I think it's very interesting. I, th I think, um, I, well, I, honestly, I'm glad you're sharing it with us. So I think this is probably a different side to an interview with a fast jet pilot who's um, been been through a, a, the experience of captivity than, than perhaps you would normally get. So, but so I'll ally with that then, and without wanting to sound like a dick, um, I wanted to ask you then: Did you, having said that your goal was to return? However long away, however, however you know distant it was from the point of ejection um, to your you know original life, um, even if it meant that actually your wife had remarried and your children had, were calling someone else dad, um, but that your goal was to go back undamaged. Were you successful? And 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 was was the, was there the idea that you could control that? Was that an illusion? No, it's an absolute not defined by circumstance that's the whole point you lock yourself into yourself uh, and you do not get defined by uh the circumstance you are who you are and I, it's my true belief that is ultimately human spirit that is i think we're only truly honest with ourselves so i had a situation where they um halfway through they took me into the room i was naked two guys 
small room, put a gun against my head again. And I remember the hammer, you know, starting to move. I could hear and you've got a quarter second or what have you before it drops. And in that moment, you have a million thoughts. And uh, the thought was, I don't want to be. I'm basically going to die now and no one is going to be, see me die. They're not going to see whether I'm courageous, whether I piss or shit myself. The simple fact is I'm now going to die. And I'm a thousand miles from anybody and there is no one left to impress. No one's going to see this. No one. I'm just going to be body on the ground. Um, and so you end up, I found myself going, I don't want to die disappointing myself. And in our lives, we're all on display. So when probably the least on display is when you're naked next to your partner, having just made love. And all the silly things we say to each other, you know, you don't want anybody seeing that because we all talk rubbish, you know, that lovely, intimate moment after of closeness. But you're probably the, the most revealing to your most intimate partner. But you don't say everything that's in your head because none of us would have a relationship if what puts, pops in our head. You just wouldn't have a relationship, you know, uh, because you, ca you can't. Whereas suddenly there's no one to impress no one to do anything and you're you're going to die so you turn inward and for me it's i wanted to die nice that's the word i uh that's my i was brought up in a family that I, my people said my family uh, that i was brought up is nice people say that at helen and me and when i did english our english mistress said you know never use the adjective nice find a better adjective but we all know what night, when everyone says nice family, they're part of their community, they're respectful, they're pleasant, they're helpful, wrapped up in this word nice. Um, so that becomes definitive. Uh, that, And I think we're only truly honest with ourselves a quarter of a second before we think we're going to die. Because there is no one, we all die alone. Um, and that is all actually a defining moment where you go no this is who i am uh, and that yes you've got to go through maybe pain loss some humiliation but you die with it, it is almost uh, the buddhist view of you know life is suffering it's how you deal with suffering that defines you and you you know you don't deal with both success and failure in the same manner it, just because you fail doesn't make you a failure. Just because you were successful in one thing doesn't make you a success. They're just events. And it's how you deal with those things as a human being that defines the quality of the human being. We just sticking with you, your sort of the, the personal side of things before we get back to the military side of things then. So I know you, you, I wouldn't ask you to speak on behalf of your wife, but what do you think your wife or what has your wife said about the, the pre-war John and the post-war John? Is there a difference? Is there an improvement in quality, of, you know, husbandship, friendship um, as a person? And sort of allied to that then, you mentioned PTSD and that's a label that has been um, appropriated by people mm -hmm. in, in, in the most inappropriate of ways uh, in recent years. But there are people who genuinely, had, who genuinely have that and it, and it is a diagnosis and I'm not going to trivialize it. But looking at some of the videos I've seen of you doing presentations, you, you're a you know you you sort of go to businesses and you lecture them. You 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 built an MBA course for Aston University here in the UK, I think. So 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 that's part of your your business life at the moment. But and this is turning into a very rambling, complex question. But I think you probably sense where I'm going with it. Uh, yeah, how many questions are in this question? You, but carry you, on going. You, you do yeah. a lot of. I'll summarize. Go. No, I'll summarize okay. the no, question. No, okay. uh, but but, you, but you, you talk about the experience, and and I, and I wonder whether or not that process of repeatedly talking about it is cathartic. Whether or not it helps with any PTSD you might have actually had. Um, so the summary is: Did your wife see a difference? Have you had PTSD? And does talking about it help? Uh Right, you got. I'm going to unpack that in a bit. First of all, uh, just talking about it help. How do I know? Because I didn't, you know, post Second World War, no one talked about their war, and everyone goes they were stoic. I don't think they were stoic. It's more that if we we were post Second World War, I go, hi Steve, uh, you know, what do you do in the war? And you replied, well, I lost my whole family. How do we get away from that? So it became impolite, I think, unless you knew someone to say, what do you do in the war? Well, I lost my brothers, my mum, my mum, my dad, my children. 
Uh, so people didn't talk about war because everyone had experienced war. And why why bring up pain and hurt to people? So people didn't talk about the war. Move forward to our generation and no one had been to war. And there was no filter. The The level of curiosity and interest, certainly because of the media as well, because it was first live televised war, was just overwhelming. You know, there was no filter. Everyone's desperately wanting to know what happened and everyone wants to know about the poo the torture and all that sort of stuff um so i had a million questions pretty much straight out uh and you answer them the best you can now because that's all i experienced i don't know whether uh the questions helped me or not it just became part of the fabric of my life so all these questions it just normally uh now there is a thing that if you take trauma, definition of trauma, you have an extreme experience which has a heightened emotional experience. We assign a meaning quite soon to the events, the, you know, the human psyche. And that's uh, and invariably we assign the wrong meaning of, you know, and the event. So that's why they say it's really important after a traumatic event, loss of a child, loss of a loved one, severe injury or what have you that you talk about it because we invariably sign a, a wrong meaning and that can years later then become trauma which means that we have a problem with uh, aspects so that's why they say it's so important to talk about things immediately after the event with people who are there so that you basically say in mind oh it was the meanings you assign were wrong you you basically understand what's happened you you acknowledge the the emotion okay so that's it. So when you say PTSD, did I suffer post-traumatic stress? Probably. Now, post-traumatic stress, and this is, sorry if I'm sounding rather lecturing here, but you go, so let's say po immediately after the Grenville d disaster, you know, the burning tower, I cannot imagine what that must have been like. And if you suddenly got up and you look up to that burning pyre, knowing that the people you love are died in there, and everyone's saying, I've got p PTSD. With respect, uh, and to say this I, without being disrespectful or unfeeling for those people, no, you've got post-traumatic stress, probably, which means post a traumatic event, you are suffering extreme stress. And it's part of your coping me mechanism as you start to come to terms. So you may be really a high, in a heightened emotional state. You may be tearful. You may, you can't sleep, cry, whatever. And that's post-traumatic stress, perfectly normal thing, okay? Some people do it rapidly. Some people do it, uh, you know, maybe weeks, couple of months. But it's a perfectly normal event. So from the information I got, about 75% of human beings suffer uh, from a traumatic event, cope. So 75% of people cope with extreme experiences. And then you've got 20, 22, 23% or so suffer post-traumatic stress, which is a, an extended coping mechanism over a, a period of time, let's say a week, couple of months, where you can't function very well. Post-traumatic stress disorder is a psychological disorder where you become dysfunctional a uh, time later. Now, that means in military, normally it's about 14 years, and it is a psychological disorder. So, so when people say, I've suffered PTSD, you know, no one's going to say it, but you know, with a great respect, no, you're not. You're suffering as any human being probably would, given the extremities of your experiences to that. Uh, and from the, the things I got given when I got returned, only about 2% of people, and it may be slightly larger now, suffer post-traumatic stress disorder. Okay. If you talk to Helen, my wife, uh, she would say, uh, I am more confident since I came back. So actually experience gave me confidence. And that's what I mean, because you've heard of post-traumatic growth, haven't you? No. Why not? There's two sides to post-trauma. You've got post-traumatic stress disorder and you've got post-traumatic growth. Why? It's not a story. It's like you saying you've got two stories of you on your holiday. God, I went to the airport. Oh, shit. You know, the the taxi was late, we got, you know, stuck on the motorway, then we got to the airport, our flight was cancelled, you know, uh, you know, almost divorced my wife, the kids were a nightmare, they shut themselves in the, the airport right in front of everyone, we had no food, no drink, slept on the hotel floor, and we had to come home. What a great story, that is a pub story for life. 
that is great. Whereas if you go, hi, John, yeah, what do you do? Oh, I've just been on holiday to Spain. Yeah, it's perfect. Uh, we managed to, uh, uh, you know, have a wonderful time with the kids. And God, you know, our grandparents went, came with us. They looked after kids. So God, my wife wear the most fantastic lawn, lingerie and we made love every day of the week and we swam in uh, Turquoise Lagoon. You have lost him, really. Oh, what a boring story. We don't want to know that. We want to know all the bad stuff. So it's not a story, sorry, but it's true. <laughs> You know what I mean? You go, really? Your life is so good. Can you just shut the hell up? I want to tell me something so that equates to my life because my life is misery. <laughs> so post-traumatic growth is, is classic Nietzsche. That which doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Post-traumatic growth is uh, that effectively our character is forged, not found. We, uh, we grow from adversity. Mm. Shed skins, we grow from adversity. And that's what I found the God did for me. I am uh, so heaven says arguing I'm a bit more emotional and that's fine by me but also uh, also as I get older you get more sentimental as you get older you think how sentimental you are now compared to when you were 20 and your testosterone is that high well now why it's called biology our testosterone move, moves down it means men become more reasonable because we have less aggression mm. yeah We've lost our balls, basically. That's why you look at the 20 year old go, God, what an ignorant young man I was. And why why did I not know that now when I was there? Well, because it's called biology. So sorry if I sound rather logical and everything and, and not sentimental, but you end up going, there are reasons why these things happen. It's, it's how you consider them in a detached manner. So you can tell here, this is a fighter pilot come up. It's don't, don't immerse in the ornament in the emotion i i found in captivity i flip-flopped sometimes in captivity your mind will run away and your worst enemy is yourself and you catastrophize uh so sometimes you have to pull that back in and go into yourself or identity and your emotional self go no i may be thinking that but that's not real other times when you're during the beating and you're overwhelmed with fear you have to detach yourself and use your rational self to go, it's not real. You just need to calm yourself. So I would, so I became pretty good at being able to control whether I'm emotionally running away myself or psychologically running away myself. Use whichever works at the time to remove that so that you keep yourself controlled. Mm. And actually, if you want to know uh, what a fighter part is, uh, the general psychology say, Fighter pilots are controlled type characters. They like to control things. Uh, and so I suppose I conformed to that. So Helen says, I'm no different. I'm just more confident. Uh, I hope I've covered the psychological uh, PTSD. And we should, by the way, I totally, I, I will put this right on because it's important. I totally support uh, therapy uh, for those who have difficulty and certainly I'll do it from a military perspective you have young men and they're sent to war 18 19 who go to war on our behalf and do things that would make a a buffalo you know throw up uh, and experience life and they come back and they have problems years later because they've kept us in our nice middle class homes with you know our Volvo car outside and yet they can't function in their life we damn well should support those people and have a conversation for as long as it needs to get them back into uh, their mental health back. And I believe in that. But not everyone needs therapy. So that's what they found after Falklands War. They, they found that by saying, are you OK? Steve, are you OK? You go, well, I thought I was OK. Maybe I'm not OK. And you can actually send someone into a spiral. So it, it, they've just got a bit clever of how we deal with psychological, uh, it, highly traumatizing events uh and how we deal with it is 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 understanding how human beings cope and some people cope immediately others over time but and therapy has its place but it's not the answer it's one answer it's being able to to weave that therapy should it be required into that person's ability to deal with it jp we're up against the 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 stop on time but uh, can i ask you one or two well, I'll follow up yeah, questions yes, just okay, on the yeah. on the military okay. on the military side of things. Then, <clears throat> when when you were going through your experience and explaining it to us, you you talked about when you stepped to the jet 
it must have been frustrating for the crew who got to the spares uh, while theirs broke and they got to the spare and the spare broke and, and frustrating for them because they they would have obviously been wanting to go out there and, and do their thing and prove that they could do it. You talked about your experience with John being excited about finally being able to say, well, I've done this a thousand times in practice. Now I'm going to do it for real. I'm going to prove who I am. You talked about coming off the target, about carrying the bomb still, and then saying, shall we reattack? We don't want to go back to a crew room and say we failed. Mm -hmm. And you've mentioned the word failure a couple of times. But of course, you, thankfully, you did get back home. Uh, you did go back to the RAF. You did go back to flying the tornado again. I wondered what, so having heard you very eloquently describe the psychology behind you know slotting in something into your mind um, compartmentalizing things having an attitude having an approach being in control what was the reception like amongst your uh, fellow aviators in the crew room um, were you accepted um, was there any guilt that you felt for 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 not being successful in prosecuting that attack and for becoming a power, what um, you know, what was it like going back into the tornado crew room after captivity? Um, most fighter pilots were great at school, great at sport, and they go through a highly selective system and it's highly competitive. So, you're a bunch of, talking about a whole bunch of uh, self-motivated, autocratic, arguably um, individuals who are competitive. What would you do? If you've done 25 war missions and done really well, been shot at, everything like that, and you get back and over above everyone's pleased to be back and your family's pleased to see no one gives you any attention. And you've got two people called John Peters and John Nicholl who get global attention and become famous. You take the piss, which is wonderful because that's how it is. Um, everyone takes the mickey. Uh, now, it's like doctors and nurses and operating theatres, military, the emergency service, it's black humour. But done in a way, and this is where you've got to be very careful sometimes with political correctness, with people's language. That's how human beings deal with each other in reality. And we all say, say the wrong things or what have you. But it's the intent behind those words. And there's a warmth behind their words. It's basically you're one of us, you know. I, and for all the public stuff of people taking the mickey, uh, everyone comes up individually because individually, he doesn't remove humanity. Hey, mate. Um, or just look at you. And this is classic. Sorry, you go, hey, Steve, um, wanker. But in that, the way... They do it. You know what I mean? You you know when you're a mate or just, but he'll put his arm, hand on you. He never does that. You know, hey, man, wanker. <laughs> and you go, yeah, thanks. And he's basically saying, you know, you get into the American, I you know, love your mate. What? We just don't do that. But the warmth and the inclusivity on that is lovely. Um, everyone came, uh, you know, and said, I wanted my war, not yours. And I, uh, we had one incident where, Long story short, where the newspaper wanted to film John and I uh, in our first flight, and we said, no, 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 don't do that. Uh, it, and um, we didn't have a choice. So they had eventually six coach loads of journalists come, and they were crowded around John and I, and they didn't even look at a single one of our friends who had all been to war. You've got 50 of your mates all been to war. And we had lost uh, a crew on our squadron. And... Uh, they didn't even interview a single one of them, and you have you know, two hundred people just focused on us. Do you know how often you apologise to all your friends on that? And it wasn't our choice. Mm. We we said no, but um, and probably the most um, emotional thing is they all understood. I found that actually more hurtful, or it hurt me more because they were so bloody understanding. Uh, and uh, a flight commander I had, um, who I didn't know that well, uh, really, pulled me aside. And he, he's a very particular character, actually, this flight commander. Um, and I thought quite an unemotional sort of bloke, really quite, you know, detached. And he called aside and he said, John Coffey, you've never done that to me. Went, okay. And he said, by the way. We all wanted our war, not your war. Don't ever worry about stuff like this. We all understand. We get it. He said, 
I didn't want your war. You've gone through something now. And that care I hold very dear. So you are, you're, you're pulled back into the stuff. So it's lovely, but done in a way that's not schmaltzy. It's done in a way that's not um, uh, inappropriate. It's done, but it's done in a very British way uh, that, you know, that is making fun. And even the air crew, when you, at air, air shows, you know, suddenly all these other air crew just coming in. We're all the same. We all went to war. We all know what it's like. And uh, they they were just inclusive. So, no, I was very blessed. You see the best of it. Final question then, JP. So just to, to, to round off where we started, really, when... <clears throat> When you joined me on the first interview, I asked you to introduce yourself, and you said, "I think the first thing you said was, I'm not a very good fighter pilot because I've got um, you know one more takeoff than landing.'" And uh, and then of course you went and and, and recalled your experiences. Mm -hmm. But I, I just wonder whether or not, from a fighter pilot's point of view, there's kind of a hole there that was never filled for you in terms of being able to go out and do the job. There is this. Um, expression uh, certainly the, on the US side of things where you say the fighter pilot's prayer please God don't let me fuck this up and I wonder you know it's really interesting to hear you talk today about the fact that actually you don't believe it was switch pegs you don't believe it was a, an error that, that by a John Nickel in your backseat it, it, there's a, an alternative explanation that you're satisfied with I, I don't think I've heard that before um, but I wonder whether or not that leaves you then with your Air Force career behind you with an itch that wasn't scratched what do you mean by an itch that wasn't scratched? Because you didn't get bomb, you didn't put the bombs on target, and you've talked a couple of times about failure. Your intro was, "Well, I'm not a great fighter pilot hmm. because." You know, do do you feel like it would have been, you know, if there'd been a Gulf War two a, a couple of years later and you'd gone in, would you have been itching to go in there and prove that you could do it, or would you have had the same sort of philosophy towards going and flying your first combat mission as you did the first combat mission? If that makes sense. I think I would have gone uh, back in. Uh, it is what a uh, uh, phrase I use all, all the time. It is what it is. So was uh, was our mission a failure? Yes, it was. It was a wrong decision for a start. Nothing to do with me. Someone else made that decision. Uh, our bombs didn't come off. Yeah. Uh, but they are trying to stop you as much as you're trying to bomb them. Uh, and there are two or three reasons, as I say, you can go as to why bombs didn't come off. Uh, I suppose because I, in during flying training, I got chopped up buttoners, which I think are covered in the first one. Yes, does it prove that they were right? Um, I'm relatively sanguine about that as well. You say maybe they did me a favour. First of all, I didn't want to be on buttoners. Secondly, uh, now my sole reason on, on buttoners was to get off buttoners, which is not a way you start a program. It's not a way you start your flying career, is it really? Um, but actually, however much I found it hurtful for my ego and everything, uh, sometimes flying is just, just timing. And maybe they saved my life. You know, back in the day that you don't even know. It's There's a great book called, five, I think, Five or Seven People You Meet in Heaven. And these are people who, uh, through dynamics of life, you don't even know, but they had a massive effect upon your life. And you don't know them. So maybe these people have made decisions of me to be in chop, which delayed everything, which made them into Maybe they saved my life because I may I could have been a dead buccaneer pilot. So you're fine from this sequence that you say it doesn't define or label you. It's an event that didn't work for you. So the Gulf was an event that did not work for for me. But then. That doesn't mean I'm necessarily a bad fighter. But one, my, one of the greatest things I had was when I became a tornado instructor at the end. And you get people who are defined as really good pilots and have great uh, reports and people who are defined as bad pilots. What I found really enlivening as I sat in the back with all these different fighter pilots, do you know, everyone pretty much average. Mm. Now, when you meet average fighter pilots, I mean, they're really, but you go pretty much the same. It depends whether the weather's good or bad. Uh, you know, but pretty much you, you rarely meet someone with real talent. That's really rare. It's godsend. It's brilliant. And you go, wow, but one in a hundred. And you probably meet three or four who could be better. Uh, do I believe I'm in a three or four? No, I think I'm a pretty average fighter pilot. 
and that's fine by me. I did my childhood dream. Was I going to be maverick? No, I wasn't. I knew that from early on. But hell, how many people want to be a fighter pilot? Uh, I got shot down. Yeah, it happened. Yes, uh, I've dealt with it. Yeah, uh, I made this decision in captivity. Could I go back and do do it again? Yes, I could. Um, and my decision had nothing to do with me. It was more if we were in formation and my number two or my number one, whoever I'm you know, in formation with, was getting attacked, would I come across and put my body on the line to save their life before my own? Yes. And I made that decision in captivity and I would not have got back in a military jet had I not had that thought. So, again, I'm... It's just an event. I've dealt with it. Could I go back and do it again? Yeah. Uh, I was on my way out for the second Gulf War. I would in it. Do I itch to go to war? No, I don't. Uh, because you've got to be a fool if you want to go to war. You know. Um, but uh, no, I'm generally overall pretty comfortable with it. I wish I, yes, like anybody who's competitive, I, I wish I was the best in the room. I wasn't. Am I in the worst in route? No, I don't believe I will. I had just had a very public um, uh, failure. But it's a failure event. It's not a defining failure. Defining means you label yourself throughout your entire life. No, I just had uh, an experience. But um, no, so I'm, does that answer your question? I'm pretty yeah. comfortable where I am. Yeah, it does. I, I, I'm, I was, you know, curious to know whether or not there was sort of the, there was a hole there that you, you kind of felt was never filled but it doesn't sound like that's the case so that does answer the question but you see you grow up as well what i mean is you know when you're young and 20 and you'd give your arm or leg just to have a trip in a flight fast jet it's definitive uh, how i say to people you join the air force you know so many people leave so it's a dream job it's a childhood dream who would leave a dream job well lots of air force pilots you see in the papers are leaving why would you leave a dream job? And the reason is, has nothing to do probably with the Air Force. And has, well, hot Air Force, nothing to do with um, flying. Because you wouldn't. Why you'd leave is you join as a, normally a single man or woman. And you then leave as a married person or in a relationship. So the challenge you have now is it used to be pilots joined at 18, 19, in, back in the day with you know older aircraft they were flying by 21 you could get 10 years before they were in a big long-term relationship with children now with university most people join have a gap year university then there's a delay through flying train la 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 they get on their frontline squadron when they're going to go away for lots of times and do all the real stuff but they're 28 29 mm -hmm. well you know, by that age, people are coupling up, they're having babies, they're doing all sorts of things, and that doesn't fit their normal life. Mm. And they're getting posted around and they they want a mortgage and therefore their spouse, want they need their spouse to work. Because now, not like when I joined, where you had one person who had an income and you could afford a mortgage, you need two people. Therefore, they can't live a life of choice for their degrees and all the stuff they're good that the military can provide. So it's the dynamics of, oh, and by the way, the military won't get more money because it doesn't win votes and um, and uh, the government doesn't have any money. So we've got someone you just spent two million pounds training who after three years disappears. So you're not getting return on investment. We haven't got experienced fighter pilots. And therefore, the system goes, oh, what? well, it's the dynamics of the world has changed. Hmm. So how do you do that? So it's, um, yeah. You leave, I, I'm i proud I was a fighter pilot, but my focus go moved from myself to my family and my children because that's what anybody who grows up does, isn't it? Hmm. That's did what you, we all do. And I think it's, for me as a man, seeing I you know, must have some selfish, arrogant focus like all people who push for a career, but once you get older, you kind of go, when you were younger, God, I was, why did I do that decision? Well, you're pushing to achieve something. But as you get older, you realise that along that way, maybe you weren't as understanding with other people's needs. But as we get older, we realise maybe, hopefully, it's a bit of life wisdom where you realise it's not just about you. 
Did your children have any interest in going into the Air Force and following in your footsteps? Uh, no, my son went into the Army. My uh, Very proud. Uh, my, my son went into the Army, an Army officer for seven years. My proud bit. He won the Queen's Medal at Santos. He was extremely sharp. He, he's been better at every single stage of his life uh, than I was. Uh, and so he's uh, a very talented young man. And my daughter, likewise, you know, she uh, has done extremely well. So, you know, and now when you say this extension, I now am a grandfather. You know, I've got my daughter's just had two grandchildren. So, again, it, it's it's less and less about me, even though I am <laughs> probably a self-centered man, partly Maybe by character, secondly, by the level of attention you have. It's very difficult when you always have, you know, how many of my mates get an interview like this? Zero. Mm. You know, so you are constantly talking about your own life experiences, which is challenging to, in normal life to not talk about them. I think that's a good note to end on, JP. And I wanted to say thank you. One of the things that's been on my mind is that you must get asked to do these sorts of things a lot. And I'm really, really grateful that you said yes to me and you've given me <clears throat> two interviews. And I think some really interesting uh, and quite uh, different insight into some of the psychology uh, behind being a fighter pilot and uh, life in general. So thank you for sharing with us. My pleasure. Good to talk to you. Thanks for tuning in to 10 Percent True. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Feel free to subscribe, and if you're on YouTube, hit the bell button to make sure you get notified of the next episode. Thanks, and take care.